Welcome back to this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. For those just tuning in, my name is Aaron Wenland. I'm Vision Fellow in Public Philosophy at King's College London and a Senior Research Fellow at Massey College Toronto. The title of this conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. And it's designed to provide support for the creation of a Centre for Civic Engagement at Kiev Mohila Academy. This centre in turn will provide support for students, scholars and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine. And we will put some information up on the page at the end of the talk. And we encourage everyone to use this information to contribute to supporting this initiative. With that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Sally Haslanger. Sally is Ford Professor of Philosophy and Women's and Gender Studies at MIT. She also teaches in D-Lab, a hands-on program using participatory design to create inclusive, accessible, and sustainable solutions to global poverty challenges. Her book, Resisting Reality, Social Construction and Social Critique, received the Joseph P. Gitter Award for Outstanding Work in Philosophy and Philosophy of the Social Sciences. In 2013-2014, she was the president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association, and in 2015, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's my pleasure to have Sally here, and she's going to talk to us today about philosophy and paradigm shifts. Sally, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me, and it's a real honor to be part of this, and I'm deeply believe in the mission um, of the benefit. So I, I hope that people will, will contribute generously. So over time and place, philosophy has been done in many different ways and the topics it considers cover a huge range of issues from logic to aesthetics, from metaphysics to political philosophy and everything in between. So it is very difficult to generalize about what philosophy is or how philosophy makes a difference. However, I think philosophy can do at least two things that have an impact on our lives. First, it gives us tools to better communicate and coordinate. And second, at least in some cases, we can use these tools to prompt a broad paradigm shift and how we see the world and our place in it. So what are these tools? Here are a few that I think should be included in the list. Techniques for reflecting on our reasoning processes so that we can be more critical about how we reason both theoretically and practically, methods for making concepts or ideas more precise and for developing new concepts, and finally, practices that facilitate stepping back from our day-to-day -day forms of communication and coordination to think about the big picture, how it all fits together, and to imagine alternatives. So in recent years, I've been focused on topics in social and political philosophy. I'm especially interested in how we become social subjects subjects who communicate and coordinate fluently within a social milieu. For example, men and women enact gender with hardly a second thought, even when correct gender performance is demanding, expensive, and against, against one's best interests. The same happens to people of different classes, ethnic groups, and races. We take up norms for dress, speech, behavior, social connection, often without much critical reflection, because meaningful coordination with others demands it. Attention to practices in particular is crucial for work on social justice because they're a nexus where individual agency is enabled and constrained by social factors, including both the material conditions and social meanings. Practices produce, distribute, and organize things taken to have value and do so sometimes justly and sometimes not. They're also a potential site for social change. So I'm thinking of practices, for example, like the production and distribution of food and healthcare and transportation. Um, there's material dimensions of this and there's cultural social dimensions of this. And this is where things of value, food and healthcare, for example, are produced and distributed. So one of the many social factors that are affect, many social factors that affects our practices is culture. As Jack Balkan, uh, a legal theorist at Yale, so eloquently states, people become people only when they enter into culture, which is to say only when culture enters into them and becomes them, 
when they're programmed with and hence constituted by tools of understanding created by a culture at a certain point in history. So such fluent agency is essential to human life, but it can also entrench patterns of behavior that are unjust or harmful. For example, dropping one's child at school is a practice that's an instance of a more general practice of parenting that relates one in multiple ways to other persons and things. Parenting structures distribute things of positive and negative value. On the positive side, love, knowledge, skills, time, sleep, money, status, clothing, toys and other stuff. And on the negative side, chores and the tedious minutia of caregiving and scheduling. These structures also reflect and reinforce assumptions about gender, race and ethnicity, class and religion, among others. Our participation in them often has unjust consequences, however, but we nevertheless enact them with hardly a thought and build our identities around them and the systems reproduce themselves. The love we have for our children and our spouses leads us to buy the right things, to invest in the right activities and generally to do things right. But what is right by these cultural standards may both reflect and contribute to systems of injustice that are largely beyond the reach of individuals who are just trying to live their lives and take care of those they love. For example, parenting practices produce educational achievement gaps, gender pay gaps, overconsumption of commodities, and emotional exploitation in a gendered care economy. So a division of labor depends on dividing people into culturally recognizable categories, mothers and fathers, bosses and employees, blue collar, pink collar, and white collar workers. We learn to read people through these categories and the apparatus of meaning, such as appearance or dress, and develop norms and expectations for those who occupy different categories. Culture, in effect, creates a semiotic net that highlights some features of the world and obscures others. So skin color is very noticeable. Um, Earlobe shape is not. Um, it creates conceptual and narrative connections and default inferences. As we are socialized, we learn how to read social meanings fluently and our attention, perception, and memory filters and shapes what is available for higher level cognition and other attitudes such as desire and love. However, the semiotic framework is flexible and fragmented. It can be torn, repaired, et cetera. So cultural tools are constantly being altered, repurposed, or discarded. One example is feminist work over the past several decades that has distinguished sex and gender, or work in critical race theory that argues, argues in favor of the social construction of race. These efforts have challenged patterns of reasoning that have maintained systems of domination. For example, consider the idea that it's natural and good for females to do the bulk of care work. This seems to assume that one's anatomy naturally dictates what roles one should occupy in the distribution of labor. But of course, social systems can organize labor in all sorts of ways and women thrive in many roles other than care work. To confine women to care work and lock men out of it is unfair, especially when care work tends to bring with it economic and physical vulnerability. And this, in short, because those who tie their well being to dependent others are disadvantaged in bargaining with those who don't. By distinguishing sex and gender, feminists have provided conceptual tools that separate an individual's anatomy from their social position. And this division allows us to think more critically about what role females have played and might play in our system of coordination, why and whether we should divide labor along lines of sex. And this has contributed to social change. It's no longer given that a woman is or will be a primary caregiver, primary caregiver, or at least that this is not, this is not her only option or that a man won't be a primary caregiver. So th those assumptions are no longer given. We no longer draw these inferences from the, the shape of our bodies, so to speak, to what role we should play. And the social meaning of sex has changed. Our cultures have changed. And slowly, and in some contexts, there's greater freedom in how one lives one's gender, both in and beyond the binary. A similar shift has occurred in thinking about race. Race, like sex, was once considered a biological trait. 
but scientific research in genomics has taught us that races don't correspond to meaningful biological categories. So we must distinguish racial appearance, that is the social markers of race, such as skin color, eye shape, hair texture, and associated assumptions about character, skills, behavior, and role in our system of coordination. Existing correlations between race and poverty, for example, are created by social practices and they're not natural or given. These insights about the social dimensions of race also disrupt assumptions that have linked appearance with criminality and, and violence. So attention to, to the social construction of race highlights the structural wrongs that have produced the patterns of racial injustice and shifts the focus from individual wrongdoers to our flawed system of coordination. Social change in the direction of justice should not focus on incarcerating, on incarcerating bad black people, you know, bad black people, but on redistributing resources, changing the landscape of opportunity and developing alternative care networks for racially subordinated groups. So philosophy, as I see it, contributes to these debates by calling into question certain patterns of reasoning that take natural facts to lead to inevitable social consequences. Critiques of our existing forms of social coordination also involve substantial conceptual change. So not just the reasoning from natural to social, but conceptual change in things like race and gender. So the sex gender distinction introduced a new concept into our repertoire, gender that was either non-existent in the past or was conflated with sex. Scientific research, scientific research together with critical race theory has also called for a substantive reconstruction of our concept of race. Race is not a biological category, it's a social category. On one interpretation of this, to be racialized as white, such as I, for example, is to be racially marked by one's light skin color, a lack of epicanthal eye folds, relatively straight hair texture, and to give that social marking a social meaning so that those so marked gain privileges across various contexts. So you don't have to say that to be white is some deep biological fact about me or even necessarily an ancestral fact about me because what's going on when one is racialized as white is one is marked by virtue of these you know, racial codes um, as of a particular racial group. And then that has meaning in the sense that it positions you to gain certain kinds of privileges or, or disadvantages. So these changes in concepts and reasoning, con changes in the concept of gender, changes in the concept of race, um, together with the broader resistance toward biologizing the social, produces a paradigm shift in our understanding of social coordination. Effective coordination is surely constrained by our bodies and our local geography and our historical conditions. I'm not saying it's all in our head by any means, but within these constraints, there are degrees of freedom that have been obscured by over-naturalizing and over-rigidifying the ways of life. We can begin to think outside the box about how we divide labor, perform gender, and address poverty and crime. Culture is an essential part of life, but culture is not fixed. It's not set in stone. And we together can open space in it for greater freedom and connection. But of course, philosophers don't accomplish social change alone just by writing articles or books. The kind of philosophy that I aspire to do is embedded in a social movement. It begins with efforts to understand the systematic wrongs and the great harms that are enacted every day and our complicity in these wrongs. It does not undertake inquiry by sitting in an armchair. Rather, it requires work with critical social scientists, biologists, community leaders, community organizations, and those directly affected. It draws both on interdisciplinary intellect, excuse me, it draws both on interdisciplinary intellectual work, but also situated knowledge of injustice. So my own commitment to the philosophical work I do is based in my experience. I'm a white woman, so I have experience with both the disadvantages of being a woman, 
that is experiences of sexual assault, of the burdens of care work and of exclusion. But I also have experienced many advantages, for example, advantages of whiteness, of class privilege and of good health. Indirectly, my life is profoundly affected by the situation of my loved ones, given that my husband is disabled and my children are black. So the complexities of combined privilege and subordination are very much part of my everyday life. And these experiences are both an inspiration and an intense challenge. I find that philosophy that inquires into the social domain and more specifically takes injustices in the social domain as its starting point makes a difference to me, but more importantly, to broader movements for social justice. However, no matter how great our ideas, it takes activism to bring about social change. So we must find a way to change practices, to change how we go on together. This sometimes involves changing what is available in our cultural toolbox so we can think differently, thinking, rethinking gender, rethinking race. It also involves changes in the material conditions for our practices shape the material constraints on agency. So the culture has an effect on how we act, how we act is engaged in the material world, in food production, in the architectural design of buildings and such like that. So material, material constraints are very real and also conditioned by culture. Activism requires collective action. Even if an individual acting alone makes some difference, warranted resistant agency emerges from a process that takes input from multiple stakeholders. Of course, because any form of coordination is an achievement, a breakdown of coordination, perhaps through natural disaster, pandemic, or war, poses great risks. So change can be dangerous, and one must depend on others to move forward. So activism is a collective effort, even if the, the incentive for activism is natural disasters or such, or whether the incentives are a recognition of social injustice and a movement to respond to that. At the same time, disruption can offer opportunities for change. When our current ways aren't working, we look for something better. And it will help to have philosophical tools to step back and think broadly to be able to think beyond how things have been done and how to reach for new paradigms. Not all philosophy provides tools for social change and social critique. Philosophy as a source of knowledge, I believe, is intrinsically good. Individual and social life are enhanced when there are opportunities to do philosophy of any sort, no matter how technical or abstract or remote. But under conditions of conflict and injustice, philosophy can make a world of difference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sally, for the excellent talk. Um, these are things in some ways that I think about quite a bit in part because uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about Kuhn at some point. So when you're talking about paradigm shifts, um, this is kind of resonating with me and maybe this is where I start, if you don't mind, I have a, a, a few quick follow-up questions. Please, uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I suppose one, the first question is the, um, the role of the philosopher in the, the instance of change or as a catalyst for change in social movements. And at some point you mentioned that a lot of people are just busy trying to live their lives and they don't exactly um, you know, have time to question the cultural norms or the cultural paradigm that they're living, breathing, working, and functioning in. Is the idea in some ways that people who are studying philosophy or potentially in the, in the academy more generally have a privileged position and potentially a responsibility to do these things because we have the luxury or the leisure time to question and critically think about these things. So maybe the philosopher is doing something like revolutionary science in the Kuhnian sense, as opposed to normal science. Is this how you imagine the role of philosophy here is? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I think that philosophers do benefit from relative leisure in their, in their labor. Um, 
in the sense that we are paid to think and to teach and to to play with ideas. Um, I mean, I don't think it's all leisure, so to speak. I think it's hard <laughs> right. work to do this um, and that it's reasonable that we're paid to do it because it is very hard. Um, but but we're given this opportunity to think critically mm -hmm. and develop these tools. And I think that this is something that we pass along through our teaching to mm -hmm. students so that students can more often, as they're facing some of life's challenges, be able to do this for themselves. Right. But I also think that philosophers learn from people in circumstances where they're, they're who are their circumstances are much less privileged. And, and so mm -hmm. they are fighting back against systems that are oppressive. And some mm -hmm. of us are fighting that in our daily lives as well, you know, because mm -hmm. there are black philosophers and young philosophers, disabled philosophers and such. But we connect mm -hmm. with people who are facing these, these um, forms of oppression more directly and we work with them. So that's why I was talking about this issue of situated knowledge that that mm -hmm. the philosopher who's working to promote social change can't just sit in her office and read mm -hmm. all these books and say, I've got the solution here. We're going to mm -hmm. go forward because what we have to do is we have to be engaged ourselves in drawing on the experiences of those directly affected and, mm -hmm. and working in partnership with them because a movement mm -hmm. takes the movement itself is, requires a division of labor, right? There are many different mm -hmm. people involved in a movement to try and, and figure out where we should go next, how we should go next. And I believe that philosophers are one, you know, we have a role in these movements, but we're not in charge of them, so to speak. We don't mm -hmm. get to say where we're going as if we right. would know, um, because mm -hmm. this has to be has to be developed together. So this is part of why in, you mentioned D-Lab, um, which is a program I'm involved in, in at MIT, and we work very closely together with um, local organizations in in areas where there's global poverty to try mm -hmm. and work with them in addressing issues with tools that they have available and resources they have available in ways that are culturally meaningful to them, rather mm -hmm. than, oh, we are, you know, the the white feminists from MIT sort of mm -hmm. trying to tell you how do you should better live your life. So that's an, a kind of example of where I think, you know, philosophical tools for reasoning and thinking and questioning, et cetera, can be helpful to everybody. And we've got to sort of promote that. And, and then others can talk to us about where they're finding the existing forms of life intolerable. Right. Um, maybe I, I will stick to the to follow up because I think you were, in some ways, you're suggesting that we we have to we need these moments to step back and be critical, but we also have to engage in what Kuhn might call normal science. We have to be down there doing yeah. the work, and in some ways, I guess maybe this is like where we come to understand what the actual social injustice is that's motivating. I guess maybe the question is, what is the catalyst for change? Kuhn talks about an anomaly when doing normal yes. science. We see something isn't working quite right in our practice. Yes. And so even though we're philosophers in this abstract, we have to be engaged in the activity and the anomaly is seeing the social injustice. Is that yeah. how you're So what, what about Kuhn this? talks about as long as you know, there's always going to be anomalies in any science. There's going to be recalcitrant data. There's going to be all, yeah. and we just live with it until mm -hmm. we, and you know, there are conflicts and some slight contradictions and, and we just live mm -hmm. with it until we have a new paradigm. And what mm -hmm. the new paradigm tries to do is come and say, yes, these are the conflicts. These are the tensions. These are the anomalies. But if we shift and think of things this way, mm -hmm. we can, we can understand it differently and go on in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think the right. paradigm shift is important. You're on the ground, you're talking yeah. to people who are feeling these conflicts and these tensions, who mm -hmm. are are caught in the middle of it. And, mm -hmm. and everybody's just going forward. They go, well, you know, normal science, mm -hmm. normal science, normal life, normal life, you know, what can we do? And then what you're trying to do as a philosopher, I think is a critical theorist more broadly, not just philosophers, but this interdisciplinary project of critical theory is going in and identifying those tensions and conflicts 
and and who they're affecting most directly and then working with them to create a new paradigm and mm -hmm. to sort of think of oh if we if we don't think of care work as something that's just for women mm -hmm. how are we going to organize it what are we going to mm -hmm. do about it etc mm -hmm. etc and then you don't just make it up by sitting in your office right. you try to figure out what are the cultural traditions that are that are going to be in place there that you can build off of etc mm -hmm. etc yeah and presumably the philosopher has some expertise in helping the paradigm shift because they're wrestling with the concepts in the way that the person who's not a professional philosopher doesn't wrestle with them exactly yeah exactly yeah. and also philosophers yeah. are pretty good at you know normative thinking so mm -hmm. and and differentiating what is and what ought to be and mm -hmm. critically evaluating whether when someone says well this is what i ought to do saying according to whom right ought you mm -hmm. to do that you know what is the right. ought there and how does it work exactly and so mm -hmm. so we can ask a bunch of different questions that open up spaces and so part mm -hmm. of that process i think of creating a new paradigm is you find the conflicts and the tensions you go in and ask certain questions open up spaces that then you can begin to sort of think of new possibilities and then you can generate a paradigm a new paradigm Okay. Well, fantastic, Sally. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm sure my Ukrainian colleagues are too. Um, I also want to thank the audience for attending and participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. I encourage everyone to contribute, give what you can. And uh, thanks again, Sally. Yeah, it's been a, a real pleasure. And I, I, I love talking to you. We could talk all day. Thank yeah. you so much.
Thanks everyone for attending What Good Is Philosophy, a benefit conference for Ukraine. Uh, if you're just tuning in, my name is Aaron Wenlin. I'm Vision Fellow in Public Philosophy at King's College London, and I'm the host of this benefit event. Uh, the event is designed to generate support for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine at this time of crisis and great challenge for them. Um, I will include some links uh, after the talk for people to contribute to this initiative. Um, and I encourage everybody who's watching to, um, to contribute whatever they can. Uh, with that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce Philip Pettit. Uh, Philip Pettit is the L.S. Rockefeller University Professor of Human Values at Princeton University and Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Australian National University in Canberra. He's the author of a range of books, including Republicanism, A Theory of Freedom and Government, and with Jose Marti, A Political Philosophy in Public Life, Civic Republicanism in Zaparedos, Spain. A new book, The State, is set to appear in March 2023. Um, Philip, thanks so much for uh, participating in this benefit conference, and over to you. Thank you very much, Aaron. I'm, uh, I'm very honored and very pleased to be invited to uh, take part in this series. Okay, so I suppose I should uh, just pop straight in. I'm a philosopher, as I guess everybody in this series is, and uh, I do think of philosophy as an integrated subject with uh, different aspects to it, rather than a series of separate disciplines. But I'm going to talk today about uh, one particular part of philosophy or aspect of philosophy, if you like, which is uh, political philosophy, as we call it. And I'm going to talk about what it does, I think what use it can be. And I'm going to illustrate it, I suppose, self-servingly in a way, but at Aaron's invitation, I have to say, with a presentation of a line in political philosophy that I quite like myself, which uh, is often called neo-republicanism or civic republicanism. And I'm going to mention at the end a, a way in which this philosophy really was put to use in, um, in Zapatero, Spain, especially in his first period in government between 2004 and 2008. Um, everything began to uh, go to crisis level, as we know, in that year, of course, because of the, grand, the great uh, financial crisis. So, okay, so uh, I'd like to talk in general, first of all, about what political philosophy does. And then I'm going to give a little presentation of the main ideas in republicanism. And then I'm going to take it to a third level of what sorts of policies this would support and what connection can have with uh, real political life, which I think is really important for a political philosophy, that it doesn't stay in the seminar room. It goes to the, as it were, the corridors of power, but also to the, uh, to the ordinary uh, sites of civic society. Okay, on the first general issue of what political philosophy does, I think of it really at, the, at this level, um, of it offers an account of central institutions in um, our civic and political life. So for example, uh, it gives an account or ought to give an account, I would say, of what the state is, equally of what the nation is, um, of what a people is, of um, what, the, of course, the economy is, and various institutions within the economy, like, for example, corporations. How do we think of those? What are the capacities of corporations? What are the, under law, the rights of corporations? And, uh, of course, that is going to lead into the question what ought to be the rights of corporations. But equally, what is law? And how does law relate to the ordinary morals of society? These are really big questions, and they're covered in political philosophy, though also many of these are covered in, for example, in legal theory and in uh, political science more generally. Although I have to say, I think that philosophy, it provides something in this area, which many of these other disciplines don't which is the high level abstract characterization of, for example, what a state is and what it, as it were, in the nature of the state, what it ought to be, what an economy is, 
and how differently economies can be organized. But at this level too, and we're still talking institutions, of course, it's going to give an account of democracy, what democracy is, the various forms it can achieve, and equally what an ideal that we describe as the rule of law is, or what the separation of powers. So you can see there are so many topics at the level just of the institutions of ordinary political life that really you need political philosophy to address and make sense of. But at this first level, apart from institutions, there are also so many ideas that are in the common discourse and that philosophy takes up and tries to articulate, regiment, um, clarify, but also sometimes revise. So for example, ideas like uh, the idea of a sovereignty, of a state. What does that amount to? What is the history of this idea? What are the claims made in its name? What are the claims that ought to be made in its name? Uh, so the idea equally of uh, a global order, what would that be? What is international law? What might it achieve? What is a global good, for example? These are all at the international level. But at this level of ideas equally, there are issues like, well, what is power and what is political power? And how does power in the polity relate to power in private life, for example? What is it uh, about power that's so important? What is it about power that is so crucial to the very nature of the state. Or authority, what is authority? And then other ideas, what is equality? And what are the demands of equality? What are the many different forms that equality can take as an idea, so to speak? And finally, an idea to which I'll be returning, what, for example, does freedom involve? And what are the different interpretations available of freedom? So this first level, I call it the level of institutions and ideas, I think political philosophy is really a very important discipline that we would let go at our absolute peril. So for example, we need in our universities, we need in our public life, institutions and, uh, and uh, uh, locales where you can have discussion of these issues, where you can, where it can enter a public conversation and these can be thrashed out. I might just enter a comment here before moving on, which is that I think of philosophy in general as taking ideas that we all have to work with and that we do work with and putting the spotlight on them and seeking then to clarify them and relate them to one another, to systematize them. So for example, this might be philosophy talking about causation. We all have a notion of causation. Our philosophy talking about free will, we all have a notion of free will. Our philosophy talking about what it is to be a responsible agent. Philosophy is essential in all of these areas, as it's our primary mode of reflection on those topics, engaging, of course, with the sciences and with ordinary life, common sense at the same time. Political philosophy does exactly that, taking the ideas that we work with as we live within these institutions of the state, of the economy, of civic society, under laws. It seeks to clarify those institutions and these ideas with which you work and to systematize them. Boy, how essential it is. I mean, philosophy in this sense, we just cannot live without. To do without it is to live the unexamined political life. What we need, especially in democracies today, is to live an examined political life. And that's what this, at this level, what philosophy or political philosophy would enable us to do. Okay, I said at the second level, I wanted to talk about what um, a particular philosophy, and I'm going to illustrate it with the civic republicanism or neo-republicanism with which I identify myself, um, what a particular political philosophy as, so to speak, what we call a philosophy of politics in the sense of a guiding normative ideal or a set of ideals, a systematized view of what is required of the state in its treatment of citizens, and indeed equally what is required of citizens in their relationship with one another and in their relationship to the state. I'm going to abstract, because of reasons of time, from the issue of what do states owe one another and what do peoples owe one another, issues about global order, which are so important. I mean, you really can't 
ignore them in any serious political philosophy. However, I'm going to ignore them, I fear, in this uh, short presentation for this uh, wonderful series. Okay, so um, what civic republicanism does as a philosophy, it starts with the ideal of freedom. I should say about the approach that um, it has a long history. Um, most of us working within the approach identify its origins with ideas that bubbled up in Republican Rome 2,000 years ago. The great figures in Roman uh, Republican philosophy were figures like, uh, well, Polybius, a name perhaps not very widely known, but Cicero, for example, a name very widely known, and of course, various historians like um, Cato, but in particular, Roman law encompassed and encoded a sort of Republican view. And ironically, 500 years after the death of the Roman uh, Republic, really, uh, Roman law was systematized by the Emperor Justinian, who then reigned in Constantinople, uh, current day, of course, uh, Istanbul, uh, systematized those principles, and they also reflect this neo-Roman or Roman republicanism. Now, that republican tradition died with the empire, in effect, of course. It was revivified in the Middle Ages. It was the philosophy espoused, you might say, in the medieval northern Italian cities, which became the great centers of European civilization. Um, it later was revivified, so to speak, in the Dutch Republic, in the Polish Republic of the Nobles, and in the English Republican Revolution in the 16, 1640s. And of course, it fed the American War of Independence and Revolution in the late 18th century, as it did the French Revolution. So it's got a long history. But it did go underground, I would say, in a way, after the moment when it reached its zenith of influence, after the uh, those great 18th century revolutions, and was replaced by a philosophy that came to be called classical liberalism. It's a very different philosophy, although it also starts from freedom. But let me talk about freedom and the Republican way of understanding it, and perhaps contrasting it with the, at least the classical liberal and also the neoliberal, as it's often called, way of understanding freedom. So in order to introduce the idea, the core idea, let me remind you, if you know it already, as many of you will, that wonderful play of Henry Gibson's called A Doll's House. And the two figures in A Doll's House are Nora, a young housewife, and her banker husband, um, Torvald. Now, under the law in the Norway, it depicts the play uh, of Norway of the 1860s, 70s. Um, women really had few legal rights. They were really the property of their husbands. The husband got to decide what the war, what theater they went to, who they associated with, what they could say, what church they could attend. Basically, the gamut of what we think of as personal choice, uh, the husband had the same. But the thing about Nor Torvald was that he adored Nora. He absolutely worshiped the ground she walked on and he gave her carte blanche. From his point of view, Nora could act as she wished within the feasible limits of the time. She could associate with whoever she wished, go to the theater if she wished. Uh, we can imagine it's going beyond Ibsen, he might even have been tolerant about what church she attended and tolerant, of course, about how she wore, what she ate, and so on. In fact, she had really total leeway, total non-interference. I mean, he held off. She enjoyed freedom. Indeed, it's the classical liberal fra phrase. Freedom is non-interference. She had it perfectly. But I want to ask you, do you think that Nora was free just in virtue of not being interfered with? And I think most people reflecting on that question realize, well, of course, she was free in the sense of being let alone, enjoying laissez-faire, as it were, at Torvald's hands. But then she lived under Torvald's will in the sense that he had no control over his own will. He might not have wanted to have such power over, but he might change. And if his will changed, then Nora's fate was changed. So she was dependent on his will remaining a goodwill in order for her to be able to continue to enjoy the leeway that he gave her, the non-interference that he gave her. He was the dominus, as the Romans would have said, the master in her life. And she 
did not enjoy freedom in the sense of being free of a master. She didn't enjoy freedom in the sense of non-domination. And that now is the Republican sense of freedom. Civic Republican idea, and this is age old really, is that a person is a free person only if they can make their range of, let's call them personal choices, exercise the basic liberties, as most of us think of them. They'll vary, of course, from society to society. But the free person can exercise those personal choices, those basic liberties, without, so to speak, um, being secure against the will of another. They don't, as it were, depend, they're not subject to the will of another. Now, that notion of freedom as non-domination, that really is the core idea in a civic republican philosophy. Let's take it of the domestic state, since we're abstracting from global order. And it would suggest two things. Well, first of all, it suggests that in the life of citizens in relation to other citizens, including in relation to corporations and churches and private organizations, so to speak, in civic life, it would require, first of all, that people enjoy a realm of choice, personal choice, let's call it, such that they are their own boss in that particular area. They are not subject to the will of any other. They might choose to subject themselves to the will of another, as in friendship or, of course, in marriage or whatever, within limits, but they do so from a position of strength. They, are, they enjoy freedom as independence from the will of others, as indeed Immanuel Kant called it in the 18th century, to belongs in the wider Republican uh, tradition. And so it's important, first of all, in a republic would be that people are secured under law as it has to be, and by the norms of the society, and by equally the organizations among citizens, they're each secured against the domination of any other, be it the domination of a spouse in the home place, be it the domination of a, an employer in the workplace who can fire you at will, for example, so that you have to anticipate his very wishes. He or she may not actually interfere with you, but if you depend on their will, just the, the way they happen to feel about you for keeping your job, then you obviously walk on eggshells, as we say. You, you basically are under their thumb. You do not enjoy freedom. Now, that's the first element of republicanism in the life of a particular domestic polity, that the law ought to protect people and give them, as you might call it, interpersonal freedom as non-domination. But of course, the masters who impose that law, so to speak, the governors, the government, the state that imposes that law, they ought not to be masters. They ought not to be a dominus in the life of their citizens. So the public aspect of republicanism is a public freedom as non-domination, that those in power ought not to be able to impose the will at their particular, the law at their particular will. They ought to be controlled, disciplined by the very citizens who live under that law. And that requires, of course, democratic institutions, electoral institutions, but also institutions like, I would say, rule of law, separation of powers, the power of contesting what the state does. And it requires citizens to actively invigilate the state, to keep eyes on government and be able, have information about and be able to speak up for themselves in civic movements or whatever. So I said at the second level, I was going to illustrate a political philosophy by reference to republicanism. Those are really, that's the core republican approach. You centralize, prioritize freedom as non-domination, and you see that what it demands in the way of security of citizens against one another under the law, and what it demands in citizens' relationship to their state, where they need public domination by virtue of democratic, democratic and other institutions. Now, at the third level, I said I would take it to the level of policy and maybe illustrated with Zapatero. Zapatero came to power in Spain in 2004, and I happened to be involved because he invited me to give a, a lecture. He had read a book of mine, and he knew the Republican tradition, of course, that had been alive in Spain during the Civil War on the side defeated by Franco. Um, he knew republicanism already, but he used my book in great part in uh, presenting his policies to the public, 
And so he invited me to give a lecture in 2004, which I did in Madrid. And in the lecture, he, after the lecture, I had chided him that it was wonderful what he was doing. And I said, which you're going to find it very difficult to live up to Republican ideals. It's very easy for me. I'm a philosopher, you know, generally an armchair philosopher. And it's easy to be a Republican and talk about what's demanded, but to be in power. I said, you, under principles that he said in my book, have devolved power over the national broadcaster, and that's terrific, away from the government of the day. Really applaud, but are you really going to be strong enough in six months' time when they're your worst critic to resist picking up the phone and telling them that they should be grateful to you and not be critical because you set them up as an independent organization. He was very fired up by that. He invited me to review his government six months before the following election for how far he'd been true to Republican principles. And I did that. <laughs> the journalists insisted on a mark, which I didn't do in my actual report, uh, later published as a book. But I, I always said to the journalist, he got nine out of 10, and he really did in that four years of government between 2004 and 2008. He introduced, he made republicanism come alive as a philosophy in public life. And he illustrated for me what I always, I think political philosophy should be at the level of actual policy and in people's lives and hearts. And he did that by first of all, taking up the call of non-domination. So his great party policy call was no domination, no domination. This became a catch cry really in um, Republican Spain under Zapatero. And he gave body to that. He gave, so to speak, body language to that. He made it vivid, vivid for people by drawing on something that those of us in the tradition had been emphasizing, which is that there's a nice test of whether in a society you are enjoying freedom as non-domination. And that test is basically, can you look others in the eye without reason, without reason for fear or for deference? Can you walk tall? You know, can you stand equal with others? Or do you feel you have to kowtow, you have to bend the knee, you have to be deferential or even fearful? If you basically can look others in the eye, including those in government, so to speak, then you're living, luckily, in a society that lives up to the Republican ideal of incorporating freedom as non-domination. He used that eyeball test, for example, in introducing one of his early pieces of legislation, and it was the third legislature in the world to do it, which was a law allowing marriage between uh, homosexuals. And he got that through and it got 65% support among the population when he got it through. And of course, it remains a centerpiece of Spain to this day. And he used the eyeball test, as I call it, in defense of that. He said, in Parliament, can any of you who are heterosexual expect a homosexual to be able to look you in the eye as an equal if you have just voted that their intimate relations should not be secured and recognized in law in the way your intimate relations are. That's a good example. He also used this notion of the eyeball test to introduce legislation governing the position of women in the home, in the defense of women, their the status in the home, what protection law gave them, or women's movements gave them. And he equally used it in the workplace, as in demanding reforms within the workplace that would enable workers to enjoy dignity, to be able to, they don't necessarily enjoy their lives, for, their jobs forever. Corporations have problems, workplaces have problems, but they can't be fired just at the will of the employer. Anyhow, I use that to illustrate how a political philosophy can actually reach ordinary people, their minds and their hearts, and that's what it ought to do. Otherwise, political policies at this level become a shopping list of policies. I think those in politics would do well to organize their policies around a political philosophy, in particular one that they can find a resonance for in the hearts of ordinary people. I'd better stop at that point. I think I've exhausted my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for uh, an inspiring and excellent talk. Uh, I think 
Ukrainians today are fighting for freedom, and certainly the freedom as a form of non-domination is is what they are fighting for. So I, I'm sure this this talk resonates for the Ukrainians who are watching, and probably the wider audience. Um, I think it's amazing that you had a chance to work with uh, a leader of uh, a country in Western Europe um, who <laughs> was inspired to read your ideas and then uh, apply them to to current affairs and. Um, I've often wondered about the relationship between these two things. When you started your talk, you talked about political philosophy as a philosophy of institutions, and in a way trying to understand what the best versions of these institutions might be, sort of the ideal, and getting clear on what the ideal is might help us then with political practice and how we regulate our current affairs. Um, and when thinking about this, I always or often wonder what Oakshot might say and the worry about philosophy becoming sort of a speculative master of political um, events, because in some ways the ideal is it's nice, it's clear, um, it's well worked out, but politics on the ground is messy. There's all these contingent sort of circumstances, and sometimes maybe the ideas need to come from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. And I just wonder what you think about the relationship between ideas and policy and sort of top-down ideas um, being applied in a state versus sort of more bottom-up organic emerging. And is there a Republican way to sort of flag the tension Oakshot saw between sort of theory as a speculative master versus the nitty-gritty of everyday politics? I think Oakshot really worked with the dichotomy of two types of state. One was the state that really was a uh, a classical liberal state that stayed completely out of people's lives. Um, he thought of freedom, as lots of classical liberals did, um, as just non-interference and saw the law as itself a form of interference rather than a necessity for protecting people, securing people publicly and indeed um, privately and indeed publicly against the state. That was one image of society where the laissez-faire image. And the other image he had was that of top-down direction of society. And he was obviously against that and was for the other alternative, although he gave it a somewhat conservative twist uh, in some ways we didn't go into. Yeah. I think that what he was missing was the third alternative, at least in my own image, and certainly I think in the traditional Republican image, um, Politics is, is indeed a messy business, and there's no steady state in politics any more than there is in economics. Uh, politics is always uh, in a state of flux, and flux that involves politicians against one another, but equally citizens against one another as they vie, etc., for influence of their ideas and citizens in relation to the politicians themselves. So, in order to basically frame this life in such a way that something like Republican ideals can be satisfied, you have to, first of all, have a constitution that lays down firm laws about, you know, the basic protections of those who might not be protected, for example, under majority rule or under the rule of uh, someone in central power. And equally, a constitution lays down the ways in which a government should be appointed and the and the uh, guidelines under which government should operate, and the information that ought to be available to citizens about how their public is actually performing. You needed a con an institution, constitution like that. And you need political parties that are, I would say, patriotic, constitutional patriots, in a phrase from Jürgen Habermas, in the sense of really abiding by this constitution, a constitution that is changeable, but only with massive support from the citizenry, ideally, you know, maybe just over 50% support of something like that. And within this constitution, there has to be room for citizens to air their different views, to look for uh, influence in politics by forming political parties, by aligning with political parties, by having uh, social movements, uh, non-government organizations, like, for example, I mentioned um, women's organizations in support of women or women's causes, or unions in support of the cause of employees. These are all necessary, and these have to be in interaction, checking and balancing one another. 
But insofar as you have that balance of different centers of power, where each person within the polity, no one is shut out. Even the small minorities are protected by the constitutional rights and by their rights of participation. And, and we're protected against the corruption of politics by, um, by the informational strata and the invigilation of, it's that sort of constant flux. It's within that constant flux where there isn't a silent rule of a single, you know, autocratic ruler, and there isn't the chaos of anarchy. It's between those extremes in that very dynamic interaction of citizens with one another and with their government that you can have the enjoyment on the part of each as of freedom as, as non-domination. You're equal with others, you can look others in the eye without reason for fear of deference. Excellent. Well, Philip, um, we are out of time, but I really, again, appreciate you participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Um, I, yes, and uh, I thank everybody in the audience watching, and I encourage everybody to um, contribute what they can to this initiative. We'll give you a few minutes to do so um, at the end of this talk. And just let me again say thank you, Philip, for um, an excellent, an excellent talk and for participating. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure my Ukrainian colleagues do too. My thanks to you.
Thanks everyone for attending this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. The title of the conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. And it's meant to generate support for establishing a center for civic engagement at Kiev Mohila Academy. This center will provide support for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine who are doing excellent work in very difficult and challenging circumstances. We'll put a slide up at the end of the talk to give you some more information about how to contribute, uh, and any and every contribution is much appreciated. With that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Anderson. Elizabeth is the Max Shea Professor of Public Philosophy at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, she is the author of Value in Ethics and Economics, The Imperative of Integration, Private Government, How Employers Rule Over Our Lives, and Why We Don't Talk About It, and what is the point of equality? Uh, Elizabeth, I really appreciate you participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. And the title of your talk today is Philosophy is for Everyone. Elizabeth, over to you. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak to everyone participating in the Ukraine Benefit Conference. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to make a donation to the Ukrainian Academy through the link provided on this website. Today, I'm going to argue that philosophy is for everyone. It's not just for professional philosophers. I mean not only that professional philosophers may generate ideas that are useful to everyone. I mean three things. First, everyone can do philosophy. Second, philosophy is at its best when it addresses problems that people encounter in their lives. Third, Philosophy is at its best when the widest range of people philosophize about the problems they confront together. From the start, philosophers have undertaken philosophical inquiry with people who are not philosophers. Socrates had numerous dialogues with various people he encountered in Athens. Plato even depicts Socrates engaging in dialogue with a slave boy. Children are natural philosophers. They have boundless curiosity. They are always asking why. They are not satisfied with pat answers. All they need to become good at philosophy is to engage in philosophical dialogue with others. My earliest memory of pursuing a philosophical question was when I was around eight or nine years old. My brother and I were wondering about the nature of time. Was there a beginning in time? Well, that couldn't be. Take any point claimed to be the beginning of time. Surely there was a moment that took place just before that point. So has an infinite amount of time already elapsed? But that couldn't be either, since we can never get to infinity. We were delighted by our discovery of this paradox. As our arguments and laughter got louder and louder, our parents finally had enough. They sent us to our rooms to calm down. So purely speculative philosophy can be really fun and anyone can do it. But here, I want to focus on philosophy that actually makes a difference to people's lives, to their practices, and to their non-philosophical practices of inquiry. I'll start with another story from my life about how I decided to major in philosophy and ultimately to become a professional philosopher. My father was an engineer who worked on the American space program. He was also involved in local politics and interested in issues of political economy. He was a libertarian. The house was filled with libertarian books. I read my father's copy of Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. This turned me into an ardent defender of free markets. My father and I also read philosophy together when I was in high school. We read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and parts of Plato's Republic. Mill taught me that I couldn't understand the case in favor of my own positions very well until I considered arguments against them. So even though I adopted my father's libertarian philosophy, I also read works by socialists and Marxists. I had numerous arguments with my high school government teacher who was a sharp critic of American capitalism and I suspected a socialist. When I enrolled in college in 1977, I intended to major in economics. In my first year, I also took my first philosophy course. 
My teacher was a passionate philosopher. He taught with conviction. He knew that philosophy really matters. He persuaded us that it makes a difference to our lives, whether Plato or Hume was right about the nature of knowledge and the nature of morality. The final reading of the course was Karl Marx's Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Here was the enemy from my libertarian point of view. I was shocked to learn that I couldn't answer Marx's critique of capitalism. I had heard about Marxist ideas of exploitation before. I wasn't really persuaded by that critique. Workers were materially better off under capitalism than under communism. But in the 1844 manuscripts, Marx focused on the alienating nature of work under capitalism. It consigned workers to tedious drudgery. This work undermined their minds and their bodies. Capitalism put workers in antagonistic relations to one another. It also set capitalists against workers. This critique hit home. The 1970s were an era of many labor strikes and high levels of worker discontent. In the summer after my second year of college, I got a job as a bookkeeper in a bank. My job was to bounce checks. In those days, this work wasn't automated. We had to do it manually. After the bookkeepers had sorted out whose checks had overdrawn their accounts, a supervisor would come in and decide whose checks would be paid, whose checks would be bounced, and who would have to pay a fine for writing a bad check. I noticed a disturbing pattern in my supervisor's decisions. The bank routinely paid the bad checks of rich customers, even if these customers had a habit of overdrawing their accounts. They always bounced the checks of the poor customers. The rich didn't even have to pay fines for their bad behavior. Ordinary people always had to pay a fine. Workers also had to pay fines on bad checks issued by their employers that the workers had deposited in their checking accounts. Even though it was entirely the fault of their employers, the workers paid a fine. In effect, employers were forcing workers to supply interest-free loans to the employer at the workers' own expense. If the workers had been big corporations, they could have charged their bosses interest and fees for this behavior, but instead they just had to suffer. I didn't need Marx to understand that this was the exploitation of workers. I also had personal experience of bad management at the bank. In those days, office work across the United States was being designed differently. Instead of an open office plan, everybody was stuck in cubicles. These days, workers might be nostalgic for the days of the cubicles now that the trend is to move back to an open office plan. But in reality, the best plan for an office depends on the nature of the work. For we bookkeepers, the open office plan was most efficient. It let us exchange documents freely, and it also enabled us to socialize while we worked. So we bookkeepers resented the change that stuck us into cubicles. Without the benefit of any kind of Marxist theory, my fellow bookkeepers interpreted cubicalization as the manager trying to control them by isolating the workers from each other. I thought the workers should have been consulted in this decision. Workers knew how to achieve better outcomes for both the employees and the bank. But I also thought that the bank's inefficient lack of consultation was a defect of corporate governments that couldn't be explained by standard economic theory, which always assumed that businesses would maximize efficiency in production. Back in college, I returned to the study of economics. I noticed conceptual problems with the concept of preference. Economists use the idea of preference to refer to actual choices, to underlying desires of people, and to people's personal welfare. Amar Chasen, a notable economist and a philosopher, argued in a famous paper that these concepts of preference are not equivalent. After all, people sometimes make choices in deference to social norms. I might be at a party and decline to take the last slice of cake, even though I really want it, 
out of deference to a norm of politeness that says we should leave the slice of cake to others and let the host decide who gets it. In this case, I certainly wasn't maximizing my personal welfare or achieving the outcome that I most personally desired. I was simply deferring to a social norm. More generally, we can't assume that individuals' market choices are always maximizing their personal welfare. Sometimes, even in the market, they're deferring to social norms to choose otherwise than what would maximize their own personal welfare. The conceptual problems in economic theory, as well as its normative gaps in theorizing the workplace, led me to switch majors. I moved from economics to philosophy. Philosophy was the place where I could better explore these problems that were, that were generated internal to economic theory and internal to the practices of markets. I was most interested in moral and political philosophy. Yet the most influential course that I took as an undergraduate, which has shaped my ways of doing philosophy ever since, was a course I took in the history and philosophy of science. In this course, we read texts of science by Aristotle, Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, and other scientists, as well as 20th century philosophers of science. This opened my eyes to what philosophers in the early modern era were really arguing about. When I originally had read works in the history of early modern philosophy, I just read them as engaged in purely speculative metaphysics and epistemology. After I learned about the scientific revolution and its impact on religious thought, I understood that early modern philosophers were really arguing over the implications of the scientific revolution and whether it undermined the authority of the church. I concluded that philosophy makes most sense and is most compelling when it addresses problems that are generated in domains of practice and inquiry that lie outside of philosophy itself. Other domains often generate philosophical problems. When practitioners are puzzled over how to proceed, they resort to philosophical reflection in order to forge a path forward. Philosophers of science, therefore, have to acquire expertise in whatever special science is encountering difficulties. For example, they might speculate about the nature of causation, but to really help practicing scientists with problems they're encountering with causal inference, they have to dig into the details of that special science and see how it works. Philosophy helps to clarify and distinguish core concepts, refine research methods and social practices in light of their goals, criticize problematic practices, resolve tensions among the normative aims of different social practices, envision different ways of framing problems to make them easier to solve, and more generally, just help people move ahead with their particular social practices and practices of inquiry. I was thrilled with the engaged style of philosophy that is practiced by contemporary philosophers of science, and I wanted to apply their methods to moral and political philosophy. In application, that meant I needed to study actual social practices and in institutions to see how and why they generate problems and construct normative, conceptual, and methodological tools for solving problems that ordinarily, ordinary people find in their daily practice. Most of my career as a professional philosopher has been devoted to developing and deploying the tools of engaged philosophy as I have worked on the problems that non-philosophers have encountered in, these, in their lives. Here's a small sample of some of the problems I've worked on in my career the commodification of pregnancy, sexual harassment, racial segregation, discrimination and inequality, campus speech wars, slavery and its abolition, the managerial domination of workers, the criminalization of poverty and mass incarceration, social insurance and how to deal with market risks, workfare and social welfare policies, bankruptcy law, the rise of authoritarian politics, and the tenacity of political disinformation, among many other topics. 
In every case, I have shown how moral and political philosophers make progress, not through pure speculation, but through normative analysis, drawing on two sources of empirical information and theory. First, they've drawn on scientific, social scientific, historical, and legal studies of the problem at issue. But secondly, philosophers also draw on the experiences of people encountering problems in these domains. The aim is to develop ideas that help non-philosophers devise better practices. For this reason, in my theorizing about the point of equality and what a society of equals would look like, I've always tied my theorizing to the interests and perspectives of people in egalitarian social movements. In the philosophy of the social sciences, my work has shown how social scientists can and ought to deploy value judgments in their research while also being epistemically responsible. For example, I have shown how practicing epistemic justice, which includes taking seriously the testimony of people from all walks of life, does not conflict with objectivity. In fact, to achieve objectivity, we have to practice epistemic justice. The 17th century John Locke once described himself as an underlaborer of the scientists. That was his role as he saw it in developing the theory of knowledge. That's quite a reversal from the pretense that philosophy is the queen of the sciences. I think Locke was right, and I see myself as an underlaborer to all who are interested in creating a more just, decent, and democratic society. To carry on this work, I have stressed how insight comes from all places, from people in all walks of life. The sharpest critiques of slavery ever written have been found in the slave narratives, not in abstract moral arguments. The richness of personal experience that freed people related in their narratives of their experience as slaves exposes the true depths of oppression involved in the practice of slavery. Everyone has something to offer in working out better ways to live and to organize society. And we have seen this fact repeatedly in the history of democratic movements. Consider the Levelers, a 17th century workers' movement that arose during the English Civil War. They proposed radical constitutional reforms. They wanted to abolish the King's veto and the House of Lords. They called for a nearly universal male franchise, and they called for equality under the law, among other radical reforms. In 1647, debates actually took place in the little town of Putney about this constitutional. Representatives of the new model army, known as agitators, held these debates with the so-called grandees, who were high-ranking officers in the same army. Charles I had been captured, and this provided an opportunity for constitutional change. So they debated the Leveler Constitution for three days. Their debates were recorded verbatim. They are among the most riveting discussions in political philosophy that I've ever read. They're at least as sophisticated as any debates we can see now in the political philosophy journals. Although the Putney debates were inconclusive and the leveler movement lost momentum, its ideas survived. I have argued that Locke's constitutional reforms pretty much follow, follow the leveler constitution. And these ideas were revived by the Chartists, a workers' movement in the 19th century in Britain. 300 years of democratic agitation in Britain led to democratic reforms many of which are akin to, although not identical with the leveler's demands. The king lost the power of the veto. The House of Lords, while not abolished, has been dramatically disempowered. Most of the Lord's privileges have been ended and democracy has led to a universal franchise, not just for men, but also for women. These democratic advances were propelled by ordinary people reflecting on political conditions and how to improve them. Now, in this process, some political philosophers really helped ordinary people articulate their ideas more clearly and compellingly. 
Yet some of the sharpest ideas came from people without special training in philosophy. Here's another more recent case that is even more dramatic. I refer to the sudden dissolution of the communist regime of East Germany in 1989. Many of the dissidents who were most critical to the democratic movement in 1989 included ordinary women who were meeting over coffee in their kitchens to complain about the regime. It happens that we know exactly what they said because secret police spies were all over East Germany at the time and they reported on what they were saying. These documents have been preserved. And what we find is that they show ordinary women who didn't have access to canonical texts of political philosophy independently formulating the central principles of democracy. They were pretty much reconstructing democratic political theory just over coffee. They were also, of course, formulating a concerted plan of public demonstrations to oppose the regime. For once, sexism worked to the advantage of women. It turned out that the secret police were too sexist to take the discussions of these ordinary women seriously. And for that reason, the regime never came up with an organized plan to respond to the protests these women were planning because they just didn't, couldn't believe that ordinary women could really make a difference. Eventually the protests got large enough to bring down communism in 1989. So novel ideas of political philosophy formulated by ordinary people have great power. Ordinary people are not always right and sometimes make serious mistakes. Of course, the same point applies to professional philosophers. Yet we have no better way of improving social life than to consult with everyone affected by the institutions we establish. My favorite philosopher, John Dewey, argued that habits of consultation and discussion with our fellow members of society lie at the heart of the democratic way of life. To do this well, we need to cultivate a generous view of other people's capacities to respond thoughtfully to discussion and extend to others the same generosity we wish them to extend to us, even when we disagree. When we practice such habits, everyone becomes engaged in philosophy. John Dewey said that philosophy recovers itself when it ceases to be a device for dealing with the problems of philosophers and becomes a method cultivated by philosophers for dealing with the problems of people. I believe with Dewey that philosophy undertaken in this spirit goes hand in hand with the practice of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I really, uh, really appreciated your talk and it had a really personal touch that I, I, I enjoyed very much. Uh, if you don't mind, I have a couple quick sort of follow-up questions. Um, so maybe it's helpful to make sure I have the idea sort of right. The, the, your vision for philosophy is it sort of emerging kind of organically from the problems everyday people face in their lives. And what philosophers do is they immerse themselves in those problems and help them think through those problems. Is that rough, a rough characterization of the view you're putting forward or have I got it sort of right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I just, if that's the view, I wonder, is there... Is there such a thing as philosophical expertise or or if if you imagine philosophers working on very different problems like the problems you listed um you know somebody working in a different area of philosophy of science somebody working in uh political philosophy somebody working in mathematics and then they're responding to all these different people is there a unity that binds this that they're all kind of doing philosophy and is there something called philosophical expertise on that picture um, well, one way to think about the role of philosophers, so a lot of my work, I'm actually pulling together findings from many different social sciences, from history and from law, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. tying them together with a normative framework, right, that most of these other inquirers haven't mm -hmm. really been thinking too carefully about. <laughs> and and right. so in a certain way, philosophers can play a role um, particularly in our in more carefully articulating normative ideas that might be inchoate mm -hmm. in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And it's very useful to have philosophical 
training to help sharpen up and clarify these ideas, and also to help orchestrate the findings of multiple disciplines so that we can focus on optimal solutions to our problems. Mm -hmm. So the philosophical expertise here is that you've had this education uh, on, say, various different theories of value, and you also have an understanding of economics where the people doing this everyday kind of work do not. And you can bring that expertise to bear when they're thinking about those problems. I, I would say that, and there's another point, and that is that yeah. every sound education in philosophy involves an mm -hmm. education in the history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And once we read, once we read philosophers in the history of philosophy against the backgrounds of the practical problems they were contending with, mm -hmm. then we find that the history of philosophy contains incredibly rich resources because mm -hmm. we are the products today of historical ideas and practices of the past. And mm -hmm. learning that history of ideas can often illuminate some of our contemporary predicaments. And that's a major theme of uh, my work on labor and workplace governance is that in many ways we are prisoners of past ways of thinking, even though the economy has changed in radically different ways, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. recognizing that historical disjunct, I think helps us move forward and think more productively about how to organize the governance of businesses today. Okay. Well, Elizabeth, I'd like to uh, thank you for participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. I'm very grateful, and I'm sure my Ukrainian colleagues are too. It's um, a huge wanna, pleasure. Yeah, great. I, I also, also want to take the opportunity to thank the audience for attending and participating. I encourage everyone to contribute what um, you can. We'll put a slide up uh, after, after this talk so you can um, get the necessary information to contribute. And uh, I just want to thank Elizabeth again. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Great.
Thanks everyone for attending this benefit conference for the Ukrainian Academy. The title is What Good is Philosophy? Uh, we're looking at the role of the Academy in a time of crisis. My name is Aaron Wenlin. I'm Vision Fellow in Public Philosophy at King's College London, and I'm the host of this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Uh, the benefit conference is designed to raise funding for students and scholars in Ukraine uh, in their time of need. And any and every contribution helps. We'll give you a few minutes after the talk to, uh, to, to make a contribution to this initiative. Uh, that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff McMahon. Jeff is the Sekera and White's Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Oxford. He is the author of The Ethics of Killing and Killing in War. He has also written popular philosophy pieces for the New York Times, the New Statesman, Philosophy Now, and a host of other venues. Uh, and Jeff today will be talking to us about what good is moral philosophy. So Jeff, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Aaron. And let me say that I greatly admire uh, your dedicated efforts to help uh, academics, academic institutions, and other victims of Russian aggression in Ukraine. Um, and let me ask also those of you who are viewing the proceedings of this conference online, please to uh, do what you can to support Aaron's efforts and his work. Um, unlike most other Americans, I, I, I'm not terribly well armed. Um, I don't even have an AR-15 that I can donate um, to Ukraine, much less a tank or uh, anti-missile system. But there are lots of other ways in which one can uh, help academics and academic institutions in Ukraine. And I urge everyone, please, to contribute what you can uh, to support Aaron's uh, admirable efforts. Now, my brief talk today is uh, meant to explain why I believe that academic work is important, uh, with particular reference to moral and political philosophy, which are the two areas in which uh, I specialize. Now, among the vast number of people who are often guided by evil impulses and uh, in recent years, two have had the power to act on these impulses in ways that have had terrible consequences for others on a really catastrophic scale. And these two are uh, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. What I want to emphasize, though, is that these two men are really importantly very diff different. Um, Trump, I think, is the purest sort of egotist. That is, he doesn't care anything for, for anything other than himself. Um, he has nothing that could be described as values or ideals. Putin, by contrast, seems to be motivated, in part at least, by nationalist and religious commitments. Um, and in this respect, he is relevantly like Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, and a number of others. All of these men have been motivated in part by ideals, or perhaps ideology is the, is the better term. But what they have done has not been motivated entirely by self-interest and a desire for power. They have been guided by other considerations. Now, people of this sort, 
people like Putin and Hitler and others of the same uh, type can't do much to achieve their perverted ideals without the support of a large proportion of the people in their society. Um, but the ones I have cited have achieved great power through their ability to manipulate large numbers of credulous and latently cruel people. Uh, and we see that now in Ukraine with what Russian soldiers are doing there because of the efforts of people like Putin and others to manipulate and coerce them. The experiments of psychologists like Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbardo have shown that a substantial proportion of ordinary people in any population are capable of acting with very great cruelty to innocent and helpless people if they are told to do so by people that they regard as having authority or if they are themselves placed in positions of authority. In one way, of course, these experiments showed us what we should already have known or what we did already know from the action of Nazi soldiers, SS agents, KGB agents, uh, Red Guards and the Cultural Revolution, Khmer Rouge and other ordinary people. Um, again, motivated by ideology at the behest of powerful leaders. Again, it's important to see that what these people were doing was motivated in a way morally uh, or, or some sort of perverted, in some really quite perverted way, morally. It, it wasn't self-interest but was rather ideology that motivated, for example, high school girls in China during the Cultural Revolution to torture and murder their teachers just because their teachers happened to be the children of landlords, landowners, and bankers. Um, and no one who knows about the history of wars between religious groups or about the persecution and torture of heretics within religious groups should have been surprised by any of this, by the behavior of children in the Cultural Revolution and by the behavior of SS agents in World War II. Um, and it's important to see that in wars and purges, motivated in part by ideology, intellectuals and academics are often the first to be eliminated for obvious reasons, because they are the ones who challenge, uh, at least some of them are the ones who challenge the ideology that uh, is being promulgated and is motivating uh, the, 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 the killing of innocent people and other things of the sort. Now, there aren't any purges of academics in uh, Western democracies, of course, now. But it is important to see that the so-called populists, so the, the populists on the political right in the United States, for example, uh, tend to have really utter contempt for academics and for academic inquiry. Um, and I think, well, people have always tended to believe that whatever simple moral and religious views they were taught as small children are infallibly correct. Um, they are resistant to skepticism and tend to think that anyone who challenges these beliefs that they've been brought up with must be either a knave or a fool. Uh, and, and when people do challenge common beliefs, people like Socrates or Jesus, they, they, they get into a lot of trouble for it. Uh, 
what's interesting now is that the populists on the political right in the United States um, think that not only are moral philosophers and other philosophers and people in the humanities and so on, not only are these people frauds, but um, even scientists are frauds now, according to these people. Uh, they tend to believe, for example, that they understand the climate better than climate scientists do. And they understand more about pandemics than a, a virologist or epidemiologist. This is really profoundly dangerous when, you know, when people come to think that the people who devote their entire lives to trying to understand some matter of science or some matter of morals are complete fools and, and, and frauds. And that you know, the, the, the ordinary people understand these matters without having to engage in any kind of academic or intellectual inquiry. Now, I, I want to say that this kind of righteous dogmatism that we find, particularly among populists on the political right in the United States and other countries, isn't entirely the monopoly of the political right, but is found increasingly on the left as well. It's epitomized, I think, by the recent response of a Cambridge academic to uh, Nigel Bigger's project to investigate how empires have been understood morally throughout history. Uh, as some, some people may know, Nigel Bigger here at Oxford was proposing to, and actually has done this, uh, uh, investigate what people have thought morally about empire. Uh, not just the British Empire, but empires generally. And he uh, said that he was open to the idea that uh, some people who were engaged in projects of empire might be really morally motivated and that, that their efforts may have done some good as well as a, you know, a, a, a lot of harm. And the response uh, when this project was announced by one academic in Cambridge was, I'm quoting now, OMG, we need to shut this down. We're shut this down is all in capital letters. Um, so this is the response on the left. If somebody wants to pursue a particular project and it, it, it is ideologically unsound, it needs to be shut down, not argued against or contended with, but shut down from the, from the start. And... Uh, I should note that this, this comment that I've just quoted appeared rather unsurprisingly on Twitter, which is a forum like other social media that seems to me ideally suited to ventilating in the heat of the moment some sort of spasm of indignation or spite or ridicule. It's the kind of forum that seems almost purposefully designed to exclude reasoned argument and the presentation of evidence. And this is one of the real problems I think that we face now that social media have become dominant in public discourse. People just throw out a few indignant phrases, a few sentences, and that's the end of the discussion. Um, but twas not always thus. Um, let me explain with a bit of autobiography here, uh, because Aaron has asked that uh, some of us um, make our talks a bit more personal, maybe explain how we got into philosophy and what, what uh, uh, motivates us in, in doing our work in philosophy. So, although I lived most of my young life in the rural American South, in a family of Republican Party activists. When I was in high school, my sympathies were with the Vietnam protesters and with people in the civil rights movement. Uh, then when I became uh, a student at the University of the South, it's called, uh, my continued concern about the Vietnam War uh, led me to discover Noam Chomsky's books on the war. 
And although Chomsky has always been prone to sort of fiercely polemical writing, he's also been a champion of academic freedom and free speech. And I remember in particular a long time ago, he uh, uh, defended publicly the free speech rights of even Holocaust deniers like Robert Faurisson. Um, and so there was, uh, what I'm doing now is illustrating my claim that there was a time when people on the left were not so uh, 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 intolerant of the expression of views that they believe to be false. Also, when I was in college, I discovered the writings of Bertrand Russell, who, although he was a moralist and an anti-war activist, urged people to have epistemic humility about their moral beliefs, not to be too confident that you've got it right. Um, another um, figure who influenced me a lot, I want to mention in this context, uh, during my second year at the University of the South in 1973, I found funding to invite a series of veterans of the civil rights campaigns to speak on campus. And the one who was most impressive to me was John Lewis, who died not too terribly long ago and who, along with Martin Luther King, always urged his fellow activists not to hate those who persecuted and wronged them, but to try instead to understand racists and forgive them. And I, I spent a couple of days with John Lewis. Um, he was just the most inspiring man I've ever spent time with. Um, his humility, his courage, his moral and intellectual integrity have been a real inspiration to me ever since. And it's, you know, and I was, I think, profoundly influenced by the way in which he tried so hard to get those people who hated him to understand what he wanted to say to them and, and also to try himself to understand why they were doing what they were doing rather than just condemning them and shutting them out. And when I was at university, my degree was in English literature, but I found myself drawn to uh, writers who wrote about moral and political themes. So Jonathan Swift, Samuel Johnson, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, and others. But after a while, I found uh, myself wanting what these literary writers failed to provide, which was the arguments for the views they espoused. And so I decided to try to do graduate work in moral philosophy. And uh, I succeeded in getting accepted to come to Oxford. I left the American South and came to Oxford. And I was here when Ronald Reagan became president of the United States and renewed the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And at that time, many of us here, as many of you I'm sure no doubt know, um, became fearful uh, because of Reagan's insistence on deploying uh, a large number of theater nuclear weapons at bases in the UK and elsewhere in Western Europe. Um, I mean, some of this was just self-interest on our part. You, know, you plant nuclear weapons all around Oxford or Cambridge and um, they, they become targets for the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons. So I became an activist with the campaign for nuclear disarmament. But one thing was really clear to me, and that is that questions about 
nuclear weapons, what to do with nuclear weapons, were very serious questions. And the costs of being wrong about such matters could be cataclysmic on either side. You know, it was really important to get this right, to understand the issues, the moral issues, the strategic issues, the political issues, and so on. It was utmost importance to get this right. And uh, because, of, be, because of my sense of the importance of getting it right, of understanding it as thoroughly as possible, I, I wrote a little uh, book called British Nuclear Weapons For and Against. Um, and it was a book in which I tried to examine as impartially and carefully as possible the arguments on both sides of the question whether the United, the, the, the United Kingdom should retain its nuclear arsenal or whether it should disarm itself unilaterally and adopt alternative means of uh, national defense. And my sense at the time of the importance of understanding the arguments on both sides, because the matter was important, it because it was so important to get it right. My 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 sense of the importance of trying to see all sides of a matter has remained with me in the work that I have subsequently done. And one thing that I would like to emphasize before I conclude my remarks is just that all the work that I have done in philosophy has taught me that moral issues are never simple. The deeper I delve into any moral issue that I have worked on in my career in moral philosophy, the more difficult I realize that issue is. Uh, I never come to think, oh, this was easy all along. Uh, moral issues are always difficult. Moral philosophy is always difficult. There are no simple answers. But the problems, like the problem of nuclear weapons, the problems are all of the greatest importance. And so are the problems that academics in other areas of inquiry uh, address in their work. And I think it's just extremely important that people realize that what academics do is both profoundly important and extremely difficult. What we desperately need now in the US, in the UK, indeed everywhere in the world, including perhaps especially Russia, is a culture that prizes free inquiry in the sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, and indeed all areas of academia. What we need is a culture that respects, and in some cases indeed even venerates, those who devote their lives to the achievement of a greater understanding of our world and our lives. What we need is a culture that recognizes that there can be, and indeed sometimes are, real experts, real expertise, people with knowledge that is not easy to come by and not easy to understand. And so this is why I think it is so vital to protect and preserve academic institutions in Ukraine and to protect and preserve academic freedom and respect for academic work in all other countries as well. This is not just you know, self-interest by academics wanting to get recognition and get paid a lot. I mean, if you, if you want to get paid a lot, you don't go into academia. That's not what we're here for. We're trying to do something important in academia, something that will be of benefit to everyone everywhere. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thanks so much for your talk, Jeff. Very inspiring. And uh, I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, I'm going to follow up with a couple quick questions. Um, 
So the way I understand your view and your engagement with moral philosophy uh, over the years is that you encounter a practical problem that doesn't have an easiest or obvious solution to your mind. And the value of moral philosophy here is really diving deeply into those issues and figuring out what the right thing is to do on these particular issues. And so philosophy in this case serves as ultimately clarifying a problem, but also serving as action guiding. Because you had suggested at some point you wanted to be an activist or you were you were engaged in activism in the 60s and 70s, but then didn't feel like you had the answer. So what moral philosophy is doing is taking these difficult issues that the world presents us and then you felt you didn't have the answers, got into philosophy for the answers in order to use that as action guiding. Is this the the way you understand your engagement in philosophy over the years? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, my work in, in philosophy has been primarily in what's called practical ethics. Um, I remember when I you know, started out working in moral philosophy here at Oxford, my first supervisor when I was doing DPhil work uh, here, my first term was Jonathan Glover, who had written about the problem of abortion, which was a, 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 an important issue. This was just a, a few years in the aftermath of uh, Roe versus Wade. And uh, I thought this is an important moral problem. It's also a very difficult one. It, it it raises all kinds of problems of metaphysics, for example. Um, when do we begin to exist? Um, do we have strong interests if we exist as fetuses? How bad for, uh, how great a misfortune is the death of a fetus for a fetus? And, and, and so on. These weren't easy issues. And yet people had very complacent views about ab abortion at the time. Um, and I think, People generally do just have complacent views about, about so many important moral issues. But as I, what I wanted to stress in my brief remarks today is how difficult these issues are and how important it is to get them right. Mm -hmm. Another thing I've written a lot about is the ethics of war. Um, that's obviously very important. Uh, I keep wishing that... Uh, uh, people, uh, you, you know, young men in the Soviet Union had written what uh, revisionist just war theorists have written about participation in an unjust war, namely that it is not permissible morally, the way uh, a lot of people have thought throughout history that uh, soldiers, ordinary soldiers, are not responsible for. Uh, merely fighting in a war that turns out or happens to be unjust. They are doing something wrong only if they violate the rules of engagement. Um, and maybe some of these soldiers, uh, who Russian soldiers who are in fighting in Ukraine now, s soothe their consciences by thinking this. They're there under orders, and as long as they're not directly attacking civilians or civilian infrastructure, they're not doing anything wrong. Um, one of the things that I've argued in my work is they definitely are. But what they're doing there now, even if they're attacking only Ukrainian soldiers, is still murder. Right. Um, maybe following up on this, although on a slightly different level, at the beginning of the talk, you made a distinction between Trump, who's acting for self-interest, and then Putin, who seems to be acting... In some, at some point, you almost use the word morally, right? And then just now you said what his soldiers are doing is not moral, even if they're just attacking Ukrainian soldiers. So the idea is that the distinction here is that Putin is acting on some kind of principle or ideology that distinguishes it from self-interest. And so that means he's acting in the sphere of morality because it's not just self-interest. He's acting on some kind of principles. But in this case, he's got the principles wrong, right? That this is This is the idea that... I was just, it was, it surprised me when you were saying that, okay, he's acting morally, um, but what you mean by morally is principle guided action. He just got the wrong principles. And this is why it's important to get the principles right. Is that roughly? Exactly. I, mean, I do think that the evidence suggests that Putin is motivated, at least in part, 
by a commitment to a kind of Russian nationalism, a Russian nationalism that was embraced by people like Dostoevsky, and even to some extent by Solzhenitsyn and others, you know, the people we mm -hmm. uh, in many ways admire, uh, important figures in Russian intellectual history, there is this strong strain of Russian messianism or whatever the word is, you know, that, that Russia um, does things the right way. Russia is the only, Dostoevsky thought Russia was the only country that really understood Christianity properly, the Russian Orthodox Church. And I think Putin has something like this set of beliefs. And we're told that he um, is influenced by the so-called philosophical work of Alexander Dugin and others, you know, who uh, are, are, who profess this sort of um, Russian and um, Asian nationalism, this sort of, mm -hmm. you know, and Putin does, he wants to reclaim these areas that were traditionally under the uh, uh, dominance of Russia and were part of the Soviet Union. He wants to bring those back into the greater Russian fold, uh, even if the people in them don't want to be uh, ruled by Putin and part of Russia or part of a Russian empire. So I do that, but I, I do think, so I think it's, I do think that there is, you know, this kind of sense that Russia is something very great and transcendent, and he's the defender of of this great thing. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's not it's not just that he wants personal power, though I'm sure he wants a lot of that too. But it, that's not all there is to it. Right. And so from from this, the idea would be that in in some way, bringing it back to a bit to moral philosophy, is that you know there is a real danger in getting things wrong. That is, if he has the wrong beliefs, um, we end up with war in Europe, um, a, a very nasty one. And the value of philosophy here is helping people get these beliefs right. And the importance of the academy is that people don't act on false or wrong moral beliefs. And so civilizations are at stake. Yes. Okay. There, there's, there's a, there's a, 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 a large and good literature on the ethics of nationalism and patriotism. Mm -hmm. And people have thought a lot about, you know, smart people have thought a lot about these issues. Uh, and it, again, it's not simple. Uh, it, nothing is simple here. There is, a, there is a great evil in the world right now, which is Russian nationalism manifesting itself in this aggressive war against Ukraine. On the other hand, Ukrainian nationalism seems to many of us to be justified. It is a defensive form of nationalism. This is a people who want to do things their way and to be independent and free. And so th th there's a lot, of, a lot of work to be done here. It's not simple black and white. Um, right. It never is. Yeah. Well, great, Jeff. Um, I think this is an excellent place to end the talk. Thanks so much for uh, participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. I value your time and I want to thank all the listeners and viewers for, for attending. Again, I encourage you to donate what you can to support scholars and academics in Ukraine. As Jeff said, the Academy is doing serious and important work and it's important to keep the Academy alive and well in Ukraine. Um, so we'll give you a few minutes to, to make a donation before we continue with this conference. So thanks again, Jeff.